Hi, I'm Sharon, Education and Youth Librarian with Wyndham City Libraries. Welcome back to Virtual Teen Read Along for Chapter 7 of Tomorrow When the War Began by John Marsden. The group have been to Ali's house and have discovered the power and phone lines are down, which is indicative of a widespread problem, and her dead dogs are clear evidence something is wrong. Let's read Chapter 7. It was terrible waiting for it to get dark. We kept starting out, saying, OK, that's enough, let's go. And someone would say, no, wait, it's still too light. That's the trouble with summer. It's day that for an awfully long time. We'd made a decision to play it safe and we stuck to it. The moon was thin and late to rise. So when we did get going, it really was quite dark. We had a couple of torches that Homer had been able to find, but we'd agreed not to use them unless absolutely necessary. We left Millie on a blanket in Homer's kitchen. She was too weak to move far. We walked along the road for about a k and a half, then branched across the last of the Yanos paddocks, taking a short cut to the lane that led to Kevin's. I walked with Homer, but we didn't talk much, except when I suddenly remembered I hadn't asked him about their dogs. We only had two left, he said, and they weren't there. I'm not sure where they might have gone. I think Dad said something about taking them to the vet. They both had eczema badly. I can't remember if he said that or if I just imagined it. Once we were in the lane, Kevin started running. There was still about two k's to go. But without a word being exchanged, we all started running too behind him. Kevin's a big guy, not built for sprinting, and he lumbered along like a draft horse. But for once, we couldn't keep up with him, except Robin, who was always fit. After a while, I couldn't see them ahead of us, but I could hear Kevin's heavy panting coming out of the darkness. As we grew closer to the house, Lee called, Be careful when you get there, Kev, but he got no reply. He bit us there by two or three minutes, I'd say, he and Robin, but there wasn't much point. His house was the same as Homer's and mine. Three dead working dogs on chains, a dead cockatoo in a cage on the veranda, two dead potty lambs by the veranda steps. But his old pet Corgi had been locked in the house with a bucket of food and a bucket of water in the laundry. She was alive, but she'd chosen one of the bedrooms for a toilet, so the house smelt pretty foul. She was delirious with joy to see Kevin. When we got there, she was still leaping at his face, crying pitifully, doing excited mid-air stunts and wetting herself with excitement. Corrie, grim face, went past me with a mop and a handful of rags. I'd noticed when I'd stay with Corrie that if things got too emotional, she'd start cleaning up. It was a useful habit she had. We had another quick conference. There seemed to be so many problems and so many choices. Robin had the bright idea that bicycles were quick and silent, the perfect transport. Kevin had two little brothers, so we scored three bikes from their shed. Homer asked if we knew anyone who wouldn't have gone to the show. He realised that finding someone who'd stayed home that day might be the solution to the whole mystery. Lee said he didn't think his parents would have gone. His sisters and brothers usually went, but not his parents. Kevin said he wanted to bring the corgi, Flip, along with us. He couldn't bear to leave her alone again after what she'd been through. This was a tough one. We all felt sympathetic to the dog, who seemed to be attached to Kevin's heels by a metre of invisible lead, but we were starting to get more and more curious of our own safety. We finally agreed to take her with us to Corrie's and make another decision depending on what we found there. But Kevin won't leave. We might have to make some ugly choices. Kevin just nodded. He knew. Robin, who thought of the bikes, ended up jogging most of the way to Corrie's. We could only get two on a bike, and she said she needed the exercise. Homer dinged Kevin, who nursed Flip in his arms. The little corgi spent the whole trip licking his face in an ecstasy of love and gratitude. It would have been funny if we'd had any emotional energy left to laugh. The image I'll always remember from Corrie's place is of Corrie standing alone in the middle of the sitting room, tears streaming down her face. Then Kevin came in from checking the bedrooms, saw her, and moving quickly to her, took her in his arms and held her close. They just stood there for quite a few minutes. I liked Kevin a lot for that. Under a lot of pressure from Robin, we agreed to try to eat before doing any more. She had been so logical all evening, and she was still being logical, even though it was her house that we would head for next. So she and I and Homer made sandwiches with stale bread and salami and lettuce and tomatoes from Mrs Mackenzie's famous vegetable garden. We made tea and coffee too, using long life milk and a little solid fuel camping stove. It was hard to force food down our dry and choked up throats, but we nagged and nagged until everyone had eaten at least one sandwich. And it did make a difference to our energy and morale. We decided as we ate that we would go to Robin's, but we knew that we were hanging, heading into a whole new set of problems. Out here in the country, where most of us lived, where the air was free and the paddocks wide and empty, we had still been moving fairly confidently. Danger just didn't seem real. We knew that if there was trouble, if there was danger, it would be in town. Robin described for the ones who hadn't been there, the layout of her house and where it was in relation to Wirrawee. 
we figured that it should be safe to go in on Coachman's Lane, which was just a dirt track at the back of a few 10-acre blocks, including Robins. From the hill behind Robins, we could get a glimpse of the town, which might tell us something. It was time to leave. Craig was waiting for me at the front door. I'd been using the bathroom. I'd forgotten that the Mackenzies weren't on town water and a pressure pump needs electricity to operate. So I'd had to go out to the bathtub in the vegetable garden, fill a bucket with water and come back to fill the cistern and flush the toilet. Crow was getting impatient, but I held her up for a few moments longer. I was coming down the passageway, past their telephone, when I noticed a message on their fax. Corrie, I called out. Do you want to see this? I held it out, adding as she came towards me. It's probably an old one, but you never know. She took it and read it. As she went from line to line, I saw her mouth slowly open. Her face seemed to become longer and thinner with shock. She stared at me with big eyes, then pushed the message into my hands and stood there shaking as I read. In a rough scrawl, I saw these words written by Mr. Mackenzie. Corrie, I'm in the show secretary's office. Something's going on. People say it's just an army manoeuvre, but I'm sending this anyway. They're needing home to tear this up so no one will know what an idiot I've been. But Corrie, if you do get this, go bush. Take great care. Don't come out till you know it's safe. Much love, darling, dad. The last 20 or so words were heavily underlined, everything from go bush onwards. We looked at each other for a moment, then had a big hug. We both cried a bit, then I ran outside to show the others. I think I must have run out of tears that day because I haven't cried again since. When we left the Mackenzies, we moved cautiously. For the first time, we acted like people in a war, like soldiers, like guerrillas. Corey said to us, I've always laughed at Dad for being so cautious, the way he carries his spirit liberal everywhere. But his big motto is, time spent in reconnaissance is seldom wasted. Maybe we'd better go with that for a while. We had another bike, Corrie's, so we worked out a way of travelling that we thought was a compromise between speed and safety. We fixed a landmark. The first one was the Old Church of Christ, and the first pair, Robin and Lee, were to ride to it and stop. If it was safe, they'd go back and drop a tea towel on the road, 200 metres before the church. The next pair would set out five minutes after Robin and Lee, and the last three five minutes later. We agreed on total silence. We left Kevin's old corgi, Flip, chained up at the Mackenzie's. Our fear was making us think. For all that, the trip to Robins was uneventful, slow but uneventful. We found her house in the same condition as the others, empty, smelling bad, cobwebs already. It made me wonder how quickly houses would fall apart if people weren't there to look after them. They always seemed so solid, so permanent. That poem mum was always quoting, Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. That was all I could remember, but it was the first time I started to understand the truth of it. It was 1.30 in the morning. We went up to the hill behind Robin's house and looked at where are we. Suddenly, I was very tired. The town was in darkness, no street lights even. It must have been some power though, because there was quite strong lights at the showground, the floodlights they used for the trotting track, and a couple of buildings in the centre of town were lit. As we sat there, we talked softly about our next move. There was no question that we had to try to reach Fee's house and Lee's. Not because we expected to find anyone, but because five of us had seen our homes, had seen the emptiness, had been given a chance to understand, and it was only fair that the last two should get the same right. The truck drove slowly out of the showground and to one of the lit buildings in Barker Street, I think. We stopped talking and watched. It was the first sign of human life, other than our own, that we'd seen since the planes. Then Homer made an unpopular suggestion. I think we should split up. There was a widespread howl of protest, if you can have that. It was different to Kevin and Corrie offering to go on their own before. They just hadn't wanted to drag us away from Homer's, but now Homer wouldn't give in. We need to be out of town before dawn, a long way out of town, and we're running short of time. It's not going to be quick and easy travelling around these streets. We're getting tired, and that alone will slow us down, not to mention the care that we'll have to take. Also, two people can move more quietly than seven. And finally, to tell you the truth, if there are soldiers here and anyone's caught, well again, two's better than seven. I hate to mention the fact that five people free and two people locked up is a better equation than no people free and seven people locked up. You all know what a whiz I am at maths. He talked us into silence. We knew he was right, except for the maths part, maybe. So what are you suggesting? Kevin asked. I'll go with Fee. I've always wanted to see inside one of those rich houses on the hill. This is my big chance. Fee aimed a tired kick at him, which he allowed to hit his shin. Maybe if Robin and Lee go to Lee's, what do you think? And you other three take a closer look at the showground. All those lights, maybe that's their base, or it could be that's where they're keeping people even. We digested all this, then Robin said, yes, it's the best way. 
how about anyone not wearing dark clothes come back to the house and help yourselves to some we meet back here on the hill at say three o'clock what if someone's missing fee asked quietly it was a terrible thought after a silence fee answered her own question how about we wait till 3 30 if anyone's not back then we move out fast but come back tomorrow night i mean tonight and if you're the ones missing and you can get back late lie low for the day yes said homer that's all we can do Kevin and Corey and I didn't need any darker clothing, so we were ready to go. We stood and hugged everyone and wished them luck. A minute later, when I looked back, I could no longer see them. We picked our way down the hill towards Warrigal Street, climbed through the Mather's front fence and crept along the side of the road, keeping very close to the tree line. Kevin was leading. I just hoped he didn't come across any creepy crawlies. It wouldn't be a good time for him to start yelling and screaming. Although the showground was on the edge of town, it was the opposite side to the edge we were on, so we had quite a walk ahead. We could move fairly quickly because we were well away from the main streets. Not that we always got many main streets. I was glad that we were moving. It was the only thing that kept me sane. It was so hard concentrating on walking and watching and keeping quiet at the same time. Sometimes I forgot and made a noise. Then the other two would turn and look angrily at me. I'd shrug, spread my arms, roll my eyes. I still couldn't comprehend that this might be a matter of life and death, that this was the most serious thing I'd ever been involved in. Of course I knew it. I just couldn't keep remembering it every single second. My mind wasn't that well disciplined. And besides, Kevin and Corey weren't as quiet as I thought they were. It was hard being so dark too. Hard not to trip over stones or tread on noisy sticks or on one occasion bump into a garbage can. We got into Racecourse Road and felt a little safer as there are so few houses along there. Passing Mrs Alexander's, I stopped for a moment to sniff at the big old roses that grew along her front fence. I loved her garden. She had a party there every year, a Christmas party. It had only been a few weeks since I'd been standing under one of her apple trees, holding a plate of biscuits and telling Steve I didn't want to go with him anymore. Now it felt like it happened five years ago. It had been a hard thing to do, and Steve being so nice about it made me feel worse. Maybe that's why he was so nice about it. Or was I just being cynical? I wonder where Steve was now, and Mrs Alexander, and the Mathers, and Mum and Dad, and everybody. Could we really have been attacked? Invaded? I couldn't imagine how they would have felt, how they would have reacted. They must have been so shocked, so stunned. Some of them would have tried to fight. Surely, some of our friends were hardly the kind of people who would lie down and not, and take it as a bunch of shoulders come marching in to take over their land and houses. Mr George, for instance, a building inspector came onto his land last year to tell him he couldn't extend his shearing shed. Mr George had been summoned for threatening him with a tire lever. For that matter, Dad was pretty stubborn too. I just hoped there hadn't been violence. I hoped they'd been sensible. I stumbled along, thinking of Mum and Dad. Lives had always been so unaffected by the outside world. Oh, we'd watched the news on TV and felt bad when they showed pictures of wars and famines and floods. Occasionally I'd try to imagine being in the places of those people, but I couldn't. Imagination has its limits, but the only real impact the outside world had on us was in wool and cattle prices. A couple of countries would sign an agriculture treaty and thousands of k's away on another continent, and a year later would have to lay off a worker. But in spite of our isolation, our unglamorous life, I loved being a rural. Other kids couldn't wait to get away to the city. It was like the moment they finished school, they'd be at the bus depot with their bags packed. They wanted crowds and noise and fast food stores and huge shopping centres. They wanted adrenaline pumping through their veins. I liked those things, in small doses. And I knew that in my life I'd like to spend good lengths of time in the city, but I also knew where I most liked to be, and that was out here. Even if I did spend half my life headfirst in a tractor engine, or pulling a lamb out of a barbed wire fence, or getting kicked black and blue by a heifer when I got between her and her calf. At this stage I hadn't come to terms with what had happened. That's not surprising. We knew so little. All we had were clues, guesses, surmises. For instance, I wouldn't allow myself to really consider the possibility that mum or dad or anyone else, had been injured or killed. I mean, I knew in my logical mind that such things were logical outcomes of invasions and fights and wars, but my logical mind was in a little box. My imagination was in another box entirely, and I wasn't letting one transmit to the other. I guess you can't really comprehend that your parents will ever die. It's like contemplating your own death. My feelings were in another box again. During that walk, I was desperate to keep them sealed up. But I did let myself assume that my parents were being held somewhere, Against their will, I pictured them, Dad, frustrated and angry, like a bull in a pen, refusing to accept what had happened, refusing to accept anyone else's authority. He wouldn't let himself begin to try to understand what was going on, why these people had come. 
He would want to know what their language was, or their ideas, or their culture. Even through my shock and horror, I still wanted to understand. I still wanted answers to those questions. Mum would be different. She'd be concentrating on keeping her mind clear, on not being taken over mentally. I pictured her staring out over the bare hills, through the fence of a prison camp maybe, ignoring the petty distractions, the background voices, the deliberate irritations. Then I realised I was just thinking of both my parents as they were at home. We reached the end of Racecourse Road. I'd fallen a little behind Kevin and Corrie, and they were waiting for me. We formed a little dark huddle between a tree and a fence. Anyone seeing us might have mistaken us for a strange black growth that had sprouted from the ground. It was getting quite cold. I felt the other two shivering as we crouched together. We'll have to be extra careful now that we're so close, Kevin whispered. Try not to get so far behind Ellie. Sorry, I was thinking. Well, what's the plan? He asked. Just to get close enough to have a look, Corrie said. We don't have all that much time. The main thing is to be careful. If we can't see anything, then we just go back to Robin's. If there's anyone there, the dumbest thing we could do would be to have them see us and come after us. Okay, agreed, Kevin said. He started standing. That annoyed me. It was typical Kevin not to ask what I thought. I pulled him back down. What, he said. We've got to get a move on, Al. That doesn't mean rushing in like idiots. For example, what if we get seen or if we get chased? We just can't go run back to Robin's place. That'll lead them there. Well, I guess separate. It'd be harder for them to chase three different people that, than one group. Then, if we're sure we're not being followed, make our own way back to Robin's. Okay. Is that all? No. If we're being strictly logical, like Homer was before, we shouldn't all sneak in close to the showground. One of us should go and the other two stay here. Less chance of being seen and less loss if one gets caught. Corey gave a, gave a little cry. No. That's being too logical. You're my best friends. I don't want to be that logical. Neither did I when I thought about it. Okay, then, I said. All for one and one for all. Let's go. The three musketeers. We slipped across the road like shadows and moved around the corner. The light from the showground reached even here, faintly, but enough to make a difference. We stopped at its edge, feeling nervous. It was as though a single step into that light would immediately make us visible to a whole army of hostile watchers. It was frightening. That was the first moment at which I started to realise what true courage was. Up until then, everything had been unreal like a night-stalking game at a school camp. To come out of the darkness now would be to show courage of a type that I'd never had to show before, nor even know about. I had to search my own mind and body to find if there was a new part of me somewhere. I felt there was a spirit in me that could do this thing, but it was a spirit I hadn't known about. If only I could find it, I could connect with it, and then maybe, just maybe, I could start to defrost the fear that had frozen my body. Maybe I could do this dangerous and terrible thing. A small, single movement was my key to finding my spirit. There was a tree about four steps away, in front of me, and to my left, well inside the zone of light from the showground. I suddenly made myself leave the darkness and go to it, in four quick, light steps. A dance that surprised me, but made me feel a little light-headed and proud. That's it, I thought. I've done it. It was a dance of courage. I felt then, and still feel now, that I was transformed by those four steps. At that moment, I stopped being an innocent, rural teenager, started becoming something else, a more complicated and capable person, a force to be reckoned with, even, not just a polite, obedient kid. There wasn't time then to explore this new and interesting me, but I promised myself I'd do it later. I still felt lightheaded when Kevin, then Corrie, joined me moments later. We looked at each other and grinned, proud and excited and a little disbelieving. Okay, what's next? Kevin asked. Suddenly he was looking to me for directions. Maybe he recognised how I'd been changed in those few seconds but then surely he'd been too. Keep heading left from tree to tree. We need to get to that big gum. That'll put us opposite the woodchop area. We'll get a bit of a view from there. I took off as soon as I'd finished speaking, so psyched up that I didn't realise I was doing to Kevin what I'd objected to his doing to me moments earlier. From my new vantage point, I could see human movement. Three men in uniforms emerge slowly from the shadows behind the grandstand and walk steadily around the perimeter of the wire fence. They carried weapons of some kind, big rifles maybe, but it was too far to see them clearly. Despite all the evidence that we'd already had, this was a first confirmation that an enemy army was in our country and in control. It was unbelievable, horrible. I felt my body fill with fear and anger. I wanted to yell at them to get out. I wanted to run away and hide. I couldn't take my eyes off them. After they'd faded out of sight again behind the trotter stables, I heard the quick rush of light feet as Kevin and Corrie reached me. Did you see the men? I asked. Well, yes and no, Corrie whispered. They weren't all men. At least one was a woman. Really? 
Are you sure? She shrugged. You want to know the colour of their buttons? I took her point. Curry does have good eyesight. We kept going, making our little dashes from tree to tree, until at last we were gathered, panting behind the big river gum. From there we peered out cautiously, Corrie kneeling, looking around the base from the right, Kevin crouching, looking through a low fork, and me, standing on the other side, peeping around the trunk. We were in quite a good spot, about 60 metres from the fence, and able to see a third of the showground. The first thing I noticed was a number of big tents on the oval. They were all different shapes and colours, but they were all big. The second thing was another couple of soldiers, with weapons, standing on the trotting track. They weren't doing anything, just standing one facing the tents and one facing the pavilions. It was obvious they were sentries, guarding whatever was in the tents, probably. One was a woman, too. Curry had been right. The showground was still set up for the show, even though it should have been packed away four days ago. But the ferris wheels and sideshows, the tractor displays and caravan, the logs for the wood chop, and the trailers selling fast foods, all were still in position. Away to our left was a silent ocean of parked cars, most sitting like dark, still animals, a few glinting in the artificial light, our car would be in among them somewhere. Some cars would have had dogs in them too. I tried not to think about their horrible deaths, like the dogs back at our place. Maybe the soldiers had compassion and had rescued them when the fighting was over. Maybe there would have been time for that. We watched for eight minutes. I was timing it before anything happened. Just as Kevin leaned around the trunk and whispered to me, we'll have to go, and I nodded. A man came out of one of the tents. He walked out with his hands on his head and stood there. Immediately the sentries came to life one of them going quickly to the man, the other straightening up and turning to look at him. The sentry and the man talked for a few moments. Then the man, still with his hands on his head, walked to the toilet block and disappeared inside. It was only at the last second, as the light above the lavatory door shone on his face, that I recognised him. It was Mr Coles, my year four teacher at Wirrawee Primary. So, at last we knew. A coldness crept through me. I felt the goosebumps prickle on my skin. This was the new reality of our lives. I got the shakes a bit but there was no time for that. We had to go. We slid backwards through the grass and began to retrace our tracks from tree to tree. I remember from a couple of years ago a big controversy when the council had wanted to cut these trees down to make a bigger car park. There'd been such an outcry that they'd had to give up on the idea. I grinned to myself in the darkness, but without humour. Thank God the good guys had won. But no one could have ever imagined how useful those trees were going to be to us. I got to the last tree and patted its trunk gently. I felt a great affection for it. Corrie was right behind me. Then Kevin snuck in. Nearly home free, I said, and set off again. I should have touched some wood once more before I did. The moment I showed my nose, a clatter of gunfire started up behind me. Bullets zinged past, chopping huge chunks of wood out of the tree to my left. I heard a gasp from Corrie and a cry from Kevin. It was as though I'd left the ground with sheer fear. For a moment, I lost contact with the earth. It was a strange feeling, like I had ceased to be. Then I was diving at the corner of the road, rolling through the grass and wriggling like an earwig into cover. At once I turned to yell to Kevin and Corrie, but as I did they landed on top of me, knocking the wind out of me. Go like stink, Kevin said, pulling me up. They're coming. Somehow, with no air in my lungs, I started to run. For a hundred metres, the only sounds I could hear were the rasping of my own lungs and the soft thuds of my feet on the roadway. Although we'd agreed, so logically, to split up if we were chased, I knew now I was not going to do that. At that moment, only a bullet could have separated me from those two people. Suddenly, they became my family. Kevin was looking back all the time. Let's get off the road, he gasped, just as I was starting to get some wind back. We turned into someone's driveway. As we did, I heard a shout. A burst of bullets chopped through the branches with tremendous force, like a sudden short gale. I realised that it was Mrs Alexander's driveway we were sprinting along. I know this place, I said to the others. Follow me. It was not that I had any plan. I just didn't want to follow someone through the darkness if they didn't know where they were going. I was still operating on sheer panic. I led them across the tennis court, trying desperately to think. It wasn't enough just to run. These people were armed. They would be fast. They could summon help easily. The only thing we had going for us was that they couldn't be sure if we were armed or not. They might even think we were leading them into an ambush. I hoped they'd think that. I wish we were leading them into an ambush. We got round to the back of the house where it was darker. It was only then that I realised that while thinking about ambushes, I'd actually lead Kevin and Corrie into a trap. There was no back fence or back gate, just a row of old buildings. Last century, they'd been service quarters and a kitchen and a laundry. Now they were used as garages, gardening sheds, storerooms. 
I stopped the other two. I was horrified by how utterly terror-stricken they looked, horrified because I knew I must look the same way. Their teeth and eyes gleamed at me and their uncontrolled panting seemed to fill the night like a demonic wind. My mind was falling apart. All I could think of was how my arrogance in taking the lead, in being so sure I knew my way, might cost us our lives. I wasn't yet sure if the others realised how ignorant I'd been. I forced myself to speak through rattling teeth. I wasn't even sure what was I was going to say, and my fury at myself seemed to come out as anger directed them. I'm not very proud of how I was that night. Shut up! Shut up and listen, I said. For Christ's sake, we've got a couple of minutes. This is a big garden. They won't go rushing around in it, in the darkness. They'll be a bit unsure of us. I've hurt my leg, Corrie moaned. What? You didn't get shot? No, I ran into something, just back there. It's a rod on mower, Kevin said. I nearly hit it too. A volley of gunfire interrupted us. It was frighteningly loud. We could see the flashes of fire from the guns. As we watched, trembling, we began to recognise their tactics. They were keeping together, moving through the garden, firing into anything that could have concealed a person. A bush, a barbecue pit, a compost heap. They probably seen enough of us to have an idea that we were empty-handed, but they were still moving cautiously. I was struggling to get some air, to breathe. At last I was starting to think, but my brain was operating like my lungs in great gasping bursts. Yes, petrol, we could roll it. No, that'd give them time. But if it sat there, matches and a chisel or something. Ali, what the hell are you on about? Find some matches or a cigarette lighter and a chisel and a hammer. Quick, very quick. Try these sheds. We spread out, rushing to the dark buildings, Corrie limping. I found myself in a garage. I felt around with my hands, locating the smooth, cold lines of a car, then quickly going to its passenger door. The door was unlocked, like most of us who lived around where are we. Mrs Alexander didn't bother to lock her cars. Everyone trusted people. That was one thing that was going to change forever. When the door opened, the interior light, to my horror, came on. I found the switch and turned it off then stood there trembling, waiting for the bullets to come tearing through the walls of the building. Nothing happened. I opened the glove box, which had its own light, but it was small, and anyway, I needed it. And there it was, a blessed box of matches. Thank God Mrs Alexander was a chain smoker. I grabbed the matches, slammed the glove box shut, and ran from the garage, forgetting in my excitement that the soldiers could be out there, but they weren't. Just Kevin. Did you get them? I got the hammer and chisel. Okay, Kevin, I love you. I heard that, came Corrie's whisper from the darkness. Take me to the ride on, I said. Before, two people had found it when they didn't want to. Now, when the three of us wanted it to find it, none of us could. Two agonising minutes passed. I felt my skin go colder and colder. It was like icy insects were crawling over it. At last I thought, this is hopeless, we'll have to give it up. But stubbornly, like an idiot, I kept looking. Then another whisper from Corrie, over here. Heaven and I converged on it at the same time. Just as we did, I saw a torch flash for a moment somewhere near the front veranda. They're coming, I said. Quick, help me push it, but quietly. We got it on one side of the driveway, near the brick wall of Mrs Alexander's studio. What are the hammer and chisel for? Kevin whispered urgently. To make a hole in the petrol tank, I said. But now I think it'll make too much noise doing it. Why do you need a hole? He said. Why not just unscrew the lid? I just kept right on feeling stupid. Later I realised I was even more stupid again because a hammer and chisel would have caused a spark that would have blown us all up. Kevin had worked out what I wanted and he unscrewed the cap. We'll need to be behind the wall, I whispered. We need a trail of petrol to it. He nodded and pulled off his t-shirt, pushing it into the tank to soak it. Then he set the cap back on the tank and used his shirt to lay the trail of liquid to the wall. We only had seconds left. We could hear the crunch of gravel under soft, menacing feet and an occasional nutted comment. I heard one male voice and one female. The two torches flashed again, right at the corner of the drive. Kevin breathed in my ear. We need to make sure they're all together. I nodded. I just realised the same problem. We could see two dark figures, but I assumed we were being hunted by the three patrolling sentries we'd seen before. Kevin confirmed it, breathing in my ear again. I saw three of them in the road. I nodded again, then took a deep breath and let out a short, weak moan of pain. The effect on the two soldiers was dramatic. They turned towards us like they had antennae. I gave a little gasp and a sob. One of the soldiers, the male, called out urgently in a language I didn't recognise. And a moment later, the third soldier came through the line of trees and joined the first two. They talked for a moment, gesturing in our direction. I must have known by then that we weren't armed. We would have surely let off a few shots by now if we had been. They spread out a little, though, and come walk slowly towards us. 
I waited and waited till they were about three metres from the mower. The small squat dark shape sat there as if demanding that they notice it. The first time I saw their faces, then I struck the match. It didn't light. My hand, which had been very steady till then, got the shakes. I thought, we're about to die just because I couldn't light a match. It seemed unfair, almost ridiculous. I tried again, but was shaking too much. Soldiers were almost past the mower. Kevin grabbed my wrist. Do it, he mouthed fiercely in my ear. The soldiers seemed to have heard Kevin from the way their eager faces turned in our direction again. I struck the match for the third time, almost sure that there wasn't be enough sulphur left to ignite, but it lit, making a harsh little noise, and I threw it to the ground. I threw it too fast. I don't know how it didn't go out. It should have, and it almost did. For a moment it died to a small dot of light, and again I thought, we're dead, and it's all my fault. Then the petrol caught with a quick, quiet whoosh. The flames ran along the line of petrol in fits and starts, like a stuttering snake, but very fast. The soldiers saw it, of course. They turned, looked, seemed to flinch, but in their surprise they were too slow to move, just as I would have been. One lifted an arm, as if to point. Another leaned backwards, almost in slow motion. That's the last image I have of them, because then Kevin pulled me back behind the brick wall, and an instant later the mower became an exploding bomb. The night seemed to erupt. The wall swayed and shook and then settled again. A small orange fireball ripped up into the darkness, with little tracer bullets of fire shooting away from it. The noise was shrill and loud and frightening. It hurt my ears. I could see bits of shrapnel hurtling into the trees, into the trees, and I heard and felt a number of bits thud into the wall behind which we were hiding. Then Kevin was tugging at me, saying, Run! Run! At the same time, the screams began from the other side of the wall. We ran through the fruit trees and down the slope at an angle, past the chook shed, reaching Mrs Alexander's front fence at the corner where it met the next property. The screams behind us were ripping the night apart. I hoped that the faster and further we ran, the quicker the screams would fade, but that didn't seem to be happening. I didn't know if I was hearing them only with my ears or in my mind as well. There's just time, Corrie panted from behind me. It took me a minute to realise what she meant. Time to meet the others. We can go straight there, Kevin called. How's your leg, Corrie? I asked, trying unsuccessfully to return to the normal world. Okay, she answered. We saw headlights coming and ducked into a garden as a truck went past at high speed. It was a tray truck from Where Are We Hardware, but with soldiers in the back instead of garden tools. Only two soldiers, though. We ran on, reaching Warrigal Street, then racing up to the Mathers Steep Drive, taking no precautions at all. We were struggling for breath now. My legs felt old and slow. They were really hurting. I stopped and waited for Corrie. Then we walked on together, holding hands. We couldn't do any more, go any faster, or fight anyone else. Homer and Fee were there, surrounded by bikes, a full set of seven now. Our dinking days were over, but ironically, just when we had enough bikes, there were only five of us to ride them. There was no sign of Lee and Robin. It was 3.35, and from the hill we could see the other vehicles leaving the showground, all heading for Racecourse Road. One of them was a Wirrawee ambulance. We couldn't wait any longer. We only had a few tired mumbled words between us, mainly to find out that Fee's house too had been empty. We mounted the cold bikes and pedalled down the hill. I don't know about the others, but I felt as I was going round and round on the spot. I stood and made my legs go harder and faster. As we warmed up, we all started to accelerate. It seemed incredible that we could find any more energy, but for me the simple need to keep up with the others, not to be left behind, forced me to increase my rate. By the time we passed the welcome to where we sign, we were going like bats out of hell. The friends are checking each of their houses and they've discovered lights on at the showgrounds. They begin to form a plan and now take the situation seriously. Which people in the group do you think are starting to stand out as leaders? Join me again in the next episode for Chapter 8 of Tomorrow When the War Began.